Hey everyone, welcome to lecture number eight, uh, our last lecture for video games and literature. Uh, this week we'll be talking about introductions and uh, conclusions or outros. Uh, this week's tasks, uh, you do not have a post this week, it is review week, so please contribute 500 words or more to peer review by Sunday at 10 p.m. Hopefully everyone's gotten their uh, first draft of their critical paper uh, uploaded to the Google Drive folder. And your main task for this week is to comment on each other's papers and then also to write your second draft of the critical paper. Uh, and then upcoming, nothing. I mean, this is the end of the term. So this is your last week. So please put in the work to, to really go out with a bang. Uh, my grades are due on Monday, so I need to have everything tallied and, and ready to go uh, a week from today. So if you would, please go on blackboard and check the grades that are there uh, if you have any questions about them please email me as soon as you can so we can get that stuff sorted and submitted by the time the term ends on Monday so last time we talked about secondary sources and, and why you use them uh, what the point of them uh, is and the, I made the uh, argument that uh, the point of the secondary sources isn't just to validate or back up your claims, uh, it's actually to highlight an ongoing discussion that you're participating in. And so this week, uh, we're going to be talking about introductions and conclusions, which are the frame, the context uh, in which you're trying to present your close readings, your, your evidence that you found through critical analysis. And so this is really an essential part of the paper writing process because any sort of fact uh, or uh, close reading observation that you've made is meaningless without the context to give a meaning. So uh, the framework is really where uh, you're going to show people why what it is you've identified is uh, significant or worth looking at or paying attention to. So we're going to start with conclusions. So at uh, the end is as the beginning. Uh, partly, well, mainly because uh, they're often easier to write uh, than the introductions. Usually uh, introductions are pretty hard because you don't necessarily know what you're going to say until you've already said it. So by the time you've gotten through all the things you're going to say, you can write your conclusion where you uh, basically explain uh, what it is that we've just been through. <laughs> so if you think of the introduction as setting the frame, the body of your paper as presenting the evidence, the conclusion is adding it all together and telling us what it means. So the first thing that happens in the conclusion typically is to return to your claim and stakes. So you'll remind your audience what it is you're trying to argue and why that you think that's significant. Then you're going to take a sentence or two, uh, perhaps longer depending how long the paper is, and maybe an entire chapter if you're doing a book. But you're going to take a, a, a moment to reflect on what's occurred in the paper. So what is it, where have we come uh, from the starting point uh, that you brought us that you laid out in the introduction. So now that we're here, now that, that we followed you along this path that you've laid out across your close readings uh, and the evidence you've presented, now what? And, and this is where you'll you'll move to the, the final part of the conclusion, which is a suggestion for new areas of consideration based on what you've already established. You brought us through all of this evidence. You've explained why it's important to think about it in the way that you've shown us. And now you want to stimulate further discussion. You want to open out to the next part of this conversation. Because again, this is always a kind of give and take discussion, really. So where you're entering a discussion that existed before you got here and saying, this is what these people have had to say about it. Here's the new evidence that makes it makes us look at all that conversation in a completely different way. And then now let's go on to uh, think about things in the new way that I've just presented. And here's what that might look like. And so your conclusion, again, is going to go from here's what I'm claiming and here's why it's important uh, to thinking a little bit about what it is that we've gotten to and then moving out to a f opening the conversation back out to a further consideration. Here's an example conclusion uh, for a paper that I made up uh, for which I don't have the evidence, <laughs> which is an odd thing to try to do, but, you know, I think it worked out all right. Uh, and I will include these samples in the Wiki 8 folder on Google Drive. But for right now, uh, I'll just read through this one as an example of what a conclusion for a paper on Ready Player One might look like. So yet, 
Ready Player One is ultimately ambivalent about the environmental issues it raises. The results of the gas crisis uh, set the, the events of the story in something like a post-apocalyptic landscape. Even so, little of the novel takes place there. The setting operates more like a convenient backdrop, licensing the character's hyper-fascination with Oasis and Holiday's taste in 80s media. And yet, their escapism reflects back on contemporary culture as well. Perhaps this indirect approach exemplifies a useful direction for environmental literature, as it avoids becoming too didactic. It would be hard to classify Ready Player One as environmental literature, and maybe that's why it works as one. So here we can see the a restatement of, of something like a claim and the stakes at the beginning. Uh, this idea that, that Ready Player One is ultimately ambivalent about environmental issues would be a good claim. And then it, it moves sort of quickly through a summary of, of what I imagine would have been the content of the body paragraphs, the support paragraphs. And then when we get to the sentence, and yet their escapism reflects back on contemporary culture as well, now we have a, uh, a movement towards stakes. And then finally, this movement for a new, a, a new direction or, or a new conversation that comes out of uh, our reading of Ready Player One, this idea that maybe there's an environmental literature that uh, works from a backgrounding of environmental issues or kind of omnipresence of our environmental issues. Uh, and this might be the way, the reason why Ready Player One is as successful as the environmental lit, even if it's kind of ambivalent, uh, this might be a way, uh, a way forward for environmental literature. All right, so restatement of claims, restatement of, I, of thesis, what do we say, why is it important, kind of quick summary through where we've been, uh, and then opening up to a new conversation, new kind of discussion. So let's, now let's jump back to the beginning of the paper. Now we kind of know where we've gotten. <laughs> we can kind of go back and kind of think about where where we started. So an academic paper, uh, usually the introduction is going to spread into several paragraphs because you're dealing with a complex idea and then getting into the you know, critical conversation that uh, surrounds it. Uh, so you know, you, typically for a five-paragraph essay, it, you've been likely been taught that the Introduction takes up one paragraph, and that the thesis is going to be one sentence. But but often, if you're dealing with a theme that works for an academic paper, it, it's really going to have to spread out a little bit more than that. And so the the pieces that you're going to have uh, are going to be uh, some first paragraph is going to raise the topic and critical issue, usually through some sort of anecdote or special case that that illustrates uh, what we're going with or what the the concept is going to be. Then it's going to highlight existing positions in the field, or basically sketch the outline of the critical conversation as it is uh, at the moment that you're entering it, and then present your thesis with stakes. And each of these can be different kinds of size. It's possible to do all of this in a paragraph, but more than likely, you're probably going to need uh, two and maybe three. Again, depending on the size and complexity of the issue you're dealing with. So here's an example first uh, paragraph. Uh, this would be the uh, raise a topic and critical issue uh, section. And you, typically this is going to work through using some sort of anecdote or uh, exemplary case scenario, but you don't necessarily have to do that. And so I've, I've tried to give you one here that's not really working with some sort of special case or special anecdote just to demonstrate how you might work it without uh, doing anything you know, fancy, I guess, for lack of a better word. So, in this example, Ready Player One by Ernst Klein recounts the tale of a lonely boy, Wade Watts, uh, who wins a contest hosted in a massively multiplayer online game called Oasis. But the conflict of the novel isn't restricted to its virtual environment. By 2044, the world has exhausted the supply of fossil fuels, and Oasis is a welcome escape from global scarcity and unrest. Watts himself uh, accesses uh, Oasis, I'm, I'm finding typos as I'm reading, Watts himself accesses Oasis from inside a discarded minivan uh, on a school issue laptop attached to a generator he powers by pedaling on a stationary bike. Ready Player One takes place in what's clearly a dystopian future, but is it an environmentalist novel? And see, so sort of move through what is from you know, a broad summary uh, of the novel uh, through a specific example that raises uh, a critical question. And it may not even necessarily have to be phrased in the form of a question. Yours doesn't have to, to move towards a question like this. Uh, and in most cases, it, it probably won't. 
but that's basically what you're trying to do is move from uh, some move from some sort of observation that then is able to raise for you uh, the critical question that you're going to be asking or, or responding to. Uh, after that, you'll want to raise the they say, I say conversation. So uh, I mentioned this last week. Uh, this is where you uh, collect the critical positions that make up the, the conversation around the game that or the text or whatever object it is you're, you're working on. Uh, you collect them, and often you can put them into one paragraph here at the beginning to kind of survey uh, what that conversation looks like. And so this is a collection of they say's, and you can run through critical perspectives, critical perspectives on your topic in a kind of survey fashion. And you'll see this a lot. It's not necess it's it primarily functional uh, and practical more than anything else. It it collects everything in one place, so you can see this is what the lay of the land looks like. And then later on, there may be topics you need to respond to in, in your uh, close readings, but this sort of early laying out of what the conversation is is usually a pretty good thing to do. And then once you've sort of laid out uh, where people are currently, you want to introduce you know, where it is that you're going to be making an entry, what it is that you're going to be adding to this conversation. So here's an example without any specifics because uh, I... It, it, environmental research is not my area, uh, but I'm imagining that there will be sources out there if you were to look for them. So there has been an upsurge of environmental criticism applied to near future science fiction novels in recent years. Probably true. I, I don't know this to be true. <laughs> I'm guessing. So uh, imaginary critic Joe Schmo argues that, and then you paraphrase in one sentence what it is that Joe Schmo argues. Then you continue like in this fashion where you do get all of the main figures. So Jane Janeson takes a different direction when she claims another para uh, paraphrasing what happens. And then you include as many more examples like this as you need uh, to lay out what are the the main uh, sticking points, the main points of, of consideration, the main areas that a knowledgeable person in this area uh, would, uh, would be aware of. And follow that up with your introduction into your your stake in the ground uh, for this conversation. So, yet, this criticism is focused primarily on novels with self-conscious environmental agendas. Again, I'm making this up, so maybe or maybe not, but you can see how there's this turn here at the end uh, towards what it is that your paper is going to be about and suggests that what you're doing is making this inroad into a conversation that's there already. And then you move on to your thesis paragraph. See, we haven't even gotten to the thesis yet. So here's an example of what the thesis paragraph might look like. Ready Player One is particularly interesting in this regard because its primary, primary investment lies elsewhere. So again, in the last paragraph, you're saying, here's what the conversation looks like. And then in your thesis, you're saying, Ready Player One is a good example or an excellent text to be looking at in this regard. There's a good, it's a good, uh, it's what we should be coming to to find insights that are available uh, right now elsewhere. So the novel is set in a near future dystopia brought on by corporate overreach and an energy crisis, but the majority of the story takes place in a virtual environment of, in the virtual environment of the Oasis. As a result, environmental issues occupy an ambiguous position in the novel, both urgent and peripheral. See, there's an argument, that's a claim. Though Ready Player One doesn't address these issues as directly as it could, their omnipresence offers a different model of environmentalist literature. And that you should hear echoing from the conclusion, right? So we've figured out in the conclusion that's where we've gotten, and so now we want to incorporate that back in to the framing. So you're highlighting to your reader where it is that we're going to go, what it is from the beginning. Where, where are we moving? Why are we going to look at all of these different parts of the text? So you want to think of your thesis as a, a contract that you're signing with the reader. So whatever you bring up at the beginning is something that you're committing to fleshing out later in your paper. Uh, for example, if you were thinking of this paragraph as a, as a kind of contract of expectations of what's going to be discussed, uh, you would, that the typical reader would look for uh, sections that dealt with the near future dystopia and environmental issues it raises, how these, uh, the presentation of these uh, relates to uh, the main topic of the oasis in the novel, something making the argument for the ambiguity that results from that interaction. And then finally, a sketch of that model that I'm suggesting it offers. 
Uh, and in this case, there probably wouldn't be space to sketch out the entire model. Uh, and that's what, kind of what the conclusion does. It, it gives that sort of you know, opening out. But that's what, if I were going to write the next paper, that's what the next paper would be about. Something to that effect. So again, all of these are going to be uh, incorporated into your critical paper. Uh, I just want to review again what that critical paper is going to entail. So it's going to be a thousand word essays on your and a thousand word essay on a critical topic uh, that is a topic with stakes that uses analysis of one or more of our texts to explore its issue. So hopefully you've already managed to pick your topic, find you picked your primary source. Uh, if you've turned in a paper, you've, you've gotten through at least these parts. Uh, and then it, uh, I said last time that you may not have gotten through your secondary sources yet. That's okay. But make sure you add them in uh, as well as incorporate feedback from, from me and from your peers this week. So that's it. No posts this week. Uh, make sure you're contributing to peer review uh, up to and hopefully exceeding 500 words. And write draft two of your critical paper. Uh, hopefully, uh, my examples and discussion of introductions and, and conclusions uh, will give you something to look at and, and focus on when you're doing your, uh, your revisions this week. Uh, if you, again, if you have any questions, as always, please email or post them in the support section on Google+, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Finally, I want to thank you all for taking this course and for all the work you did over the course of the term. This was an experimental course. It was the first time I taught it. Uh, it was the first time I taught online solely, and the first time I used Google Plus as a platform. And generally speaking, I think it was uh, a success. Uh, I think the text came together better than I would have expected, and I think that the platform actually has uh, some value in this this application. So uh, again, thank you for putting up with some of the newness of this and and dealing with uh, me learning how to communicate with you online. Uh, so. Uh, also, soon enough, you're going to be receiving an evaluation on Blackboard, uh, a way to give me feedback on the course. And I ask you to please take this seriously and fill it out as best as you can. Uh, I'm going to be tweaking this course and hopefully offering it as a full-fledged course on campus uh, sometime soon. And probably again as an online course in the summer. So any feedback you can give me on the course text or uh, the, the use of Google Plus platform, the assignments, anything that you think uh, would be useful for me as I tr as I try to uh, build this course out into something you know, better and, and, and more refined. Uh, please uh, share it. I, I would be happy to hear it, and uh, I really welcome and value your feedback. So uh, finally, again, thank you for the work that you did, and um, if you're coming back, I'll see you around campus, and, and have a great summer.